Uh, okay, so um, uh, it's the title slide again um, for the benefit of the recording. Um, so my background, I have 12 years experience of um, uh, being in the RAF as an engineer officer um, with varied platform experience. And while I was at T Tornado uh, in the project team working for defence equipment and support um, as a structures desk officer, um, I was motivated to look into to, um, how we should support decision makers um, who are deliberating on structural integrity faults um, better. Uh, so I started um, my PhD in 2018 full time um, at Cranfield University, which was a fantastic opportunity um, given to me by the Air Force. Um, and I finished in uh, 2021, so last year. Um, and there's a reference there to my thesis and uh, a bit of a nod to uh, my first paper published, which came out two weeks ago, which I'm pretty chuffed with. Um, uh, so they're referenced there. So that's the, just a brief background of, of me. Um, the genesis of my research project, as I alluded to, um, and, and why is it relevant to, to this audience? Well, I was working in the Tornado project team and um, this particular fault um, manifested uh, across the fleet. Uh, a number of aircraft were affected, including some on ops, and it was a modification plate which was showing signs of um, corrosion, or we had no confidence that a corrosion inhibitor had been applied um, when the modification plate had been attached. And the only way to um, positively verify was to take the plate off, um, but that incurred uh, quite a hefty maintenance burden. And some of the platforms were, some of the aircraft were, were um, delivering on operations at the time. And um, the decision fell to me to provide a risk assessment of the situation to my line management. Um, and there was an expectation for me to, to provide a probabilistic interpretation of how likely it was that um, um, this would influence the airworthiness of the platform. And I felt extremely uncomfortable at having been asked to do this because uh, I didn't have any of the material data. And even if I did, um, I was not expert in this particular um, type of structural calculation. Um, my undergraduate degree had been completed about eight years prior to that, so uh, any practice knowledge would have been long forgotten. Um, and uh, it, it felt morally um, unjustifiable that I should have to put a likelihood on this because I felt like I was misinforming um, the decision makers about what the chances were. Um, and during the course of my research, I found that this wasn't necessarily specific to military aviation. Um, indeed, the Challenger uh, disaster in 86 um, had similar circumstances where um, uh, judgment was used um, to try and stop the flight. But unfortunately, because the data was uncorrelated, um, their, their judgments weren't listened to and the aircraft launched and ended in disaster, um, as most of you should know. Uh, and then in uh, a slightly different context, this is the uh, railways, UK railways network. Um, the viaduct here is the Lamington viaduct in Scotland and in 2015 it experienced collapse of the um, uh, or at least partial collapse of the support structure despite the fact that an analytical risk analysis or three uh, risk analyses had uh, found the viaduct at high risk of um, a, a damage called scour which is where there's flooding conditions and a lot higher volume water um, erodes the foundations under underneath the um, the support structure essentially um, so it's not common to uh, not uncommon um, I should say in engineering decision making and indeed it's it goes across other domains um, but specifically what I was interested in um, is risk decision making in operational environments um, and and specific towards structural damage because that was the genesis of, of where my motivation came from but the, the particulars of the context were that I was interested in aviation domain um, in situations where there was an existing risk management uh, system operating and directing how people should act, um, where there were operational constraints on time, resource and information, and where there was a human component who was required to select an intervention. So to with that brief introduction, the, the purpose of this presentation is really, I, I don't want to do a step-by-step, a -step, um, here's what I did through my thesis along the lines of what my viva was, um, but what I want to do is try and convince you that more attention should be paid to judgment-based decision-making about aircraft engineering risks, um, specifically um, contextualised by structural faults. Um, so I'll step you through the, the context definition in a bit more detail, um, talk a bit about the theory and practice that informed where my research went, and then talk about the 
judgment uh, based decision aid that I generated and tested through my research and formed the basis of my uh, PhD. So the first contextual element is the existing risk management. Now, the application of risk to aviation is, is heavily governed by regulation um, and both in the civilian sector and in the military. And these are extracts from both um, sets of regulatory um, publications, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, and these requirements um, for risk um, include subjective terms, uh, which I've highlighted there. And that subjectivity um, is not really supported by anything which says, here's how you should use your judgment to come to um, subjective conclusions on there. It's really left to the end users to, to come up with how they should um, uh, use their subjectivity. And, but in particular, when you're talking about in the, in the military examples on the right, you can see um, a LARP and tolerable require risk values to be justified. Um, and that's that piqued my interest here because it was like, well, if you're asking for them to be justified, how do you want them to be justified? Um, so that was the, the first contextual element that framed my research. The next was um, the limitations on the situation, and that was by three, three variables, time, resource and information. For time, it might be that the the um, time or decision horizon is limited by a very clear and apparent operational need, um, but it also might be self-imposed. So it might be a, um, your own personal motivations to meet a, a deadline for a decision because you, you're expecting your reputation to be affected if you haven't uh, been able to make a decision on something critical. Um, in terms of resource, it might be that the tools or the equipment that you've got, um, or even the people that you have, um, cannot, um, deliver you the the requisite solution to your fault that you're deliberating in that circumstance and then from an information point of view it might be that the advice that you've got access to or the repair instructions that you're using might not be um, supportive of the, the particular circumstance that you're uh, that you're dealing with so they're the operational constraints and then finally is the human component and here we we very uh, uh, commonly expect decision makers that they're empowered to make decisions about risk um, in the maintenance environment. We in the military, we classify them as SQUEP, suitably qualified and experienced person. Um, and here they're, they're given decision making, uh, delegated to decision making authorities, but they're generally speaking managers. Um, they're not specialists who uh, know how to do finite element methods or um, particular analytical techniques on structural faults. Um, so that's something to bear in mind as, as um, I present the next couple of slides. <clears throat> so structural faults um, are many and varied. And if I step you through this rather busy looking um, uh, flow diagram, this, this was the type of um, breakdown of how in my mind, I was expecting to have to make a decision about the fault that, that I was experiencing. So um, me being uh, the analyst, not the ultimate decision maker, um, is expected to weigh up all of the variables and information um, that were available for the particular issue that I was dealing with. And that can include things like aircraft history in terms of um, where's it been and what kind of flying has it done, whether it's display flying, uh, which can accrue a lot more fatigue life or whether it's um, more benign uh, reconnaissance missions or something like that. Um, and take that all into consideration as to um, what sort of outcome um, we're expecting and therefore what decision I should make, whether we repair the fault, whether we replace the component, whether we defer the fault, um, uh, repair, which means you carry on flying, or whether you accept it um, as it is. And and I've put in there the four T's as well, which you might be familiar with for, for risk management, uh, which is a common uh, uh, expression for how to uh, deliberate on your risk treatment. Um, and then that would be put forward to a decision maker who'd then add some more value judgments on things like um, what does the contract say, what does the regulator say, um, and um, other such um, value judgments. But that can be simplified even further um, by essentially saying, are you going to ground the aircraft or are you going to fly the aircraft? And if you ground the aircraft at so the bottom line of this decision tree, then um, that's your certain certain outcome, because if you um, you have certainty about the fact that you will have no accident, but you'll also not achieve the mission. And that might be unacceptable to some stakeholders in your decision making environment. On the contrary, if you fly the aircraft, then you introduce this probabilistic factor P, um, and that is that 
the fault being present on the aircraft may increase your chances of having an accident, which is obviously your lowest um, uh, desirable outcome because you have an accident, meaning you lose the aircraft, potentially people as well, and any other impacts like reputation, uh, perhaps loss of life on the ground, um, but also you don't achieve your mission. And in the military, that's that tends to sometimes be one of the um, uh, very critical factors alongside safety. Um, but then the contrary to that is um, you have a chance of one minus P of succeeding with your your mission and having no accident and the fault not leading to um, uh, to failure of airworthiness. So that method for calculating P is really what we're getting to the nub here of, of, of risk. So what I then moved on to um, was trying to build up a picture of my research as to how do I proceed through this this decision problem um, <clears throat> and the overall aim was to support engineers in in uh, their deliberations about the, this sort of problem for every fault that they come across where they're, 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 they have that decision um, issue and I split that into two key objectives one was to understand what the beliefs and practices of real world practitioners um, uh, was um, through case studies and um, some surveys of practitioners and another was and th the second objective was to then use those results uh, from that um, uh, information gathering exercise to then uh, create a uh, decision aid to support those decision makers better um, under operational constraints the constraints that I mentioned earlier so the first part of that to to look at what's done already essentially uh, involved looking at the literature first. So risk, first of all, um, as a theory and as a concept, um, is generally well accepted. It's, its practical usefulness is well founded across lots of disciplines and industries, and it's made up of these two components, um, consequences about something that humans value and an uncertainty. <clears throat> However, risk is not necessarily, um, that's that's your, your total um, risk your your pure risk if you want if you like um, but what's presented um, following a risk assessment is actually a characterization of risk and this is dependent on the consequences that you choose to model and the uncertainty measure that you choose to apply to your uh, to your measure and these are selected by the individual which means that they're conditional on the background knowledge of that individual but that value k that you can see in the characterization equation there or the, um, the description um, is usually hidden. Um, it, it's influenced by things like feelings and values or likes and dislikes, but it's never talked about really, um, which is interesting because there's a bunch of research here um, and, and this is a very small um, <laughs> sample of an extremely large list um, uh, where they uh, describe that humans can be uh, biased and misled, their decision makings are misled and they can be can seen as irrational um, given the information that they're presented and in particular some more recent research has shown those sorts of effects specifically in, in engineers um, and that's uh, most of the older research about psychology um, effects um, tends to be on benign subjects so it's been a bit more refreshing to see some um, more specific and applied cases um, so ambiguity in, in aversion in engineers by Brown and Utley in 2019 for example showed that engineers have a uh, tendency to be averse to ambiguity and they prefer certainty for example um, but they're the types of things that that um, uh, we're talking about when it comes to using judgment they're the type of effects that we should be um, should be part of our dialogue but in my experience, they're not. <clears throat> a great example of this is uh, the World Economic Forum. Um, in light of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, um, they appear to have uh, increased their risk assessment of, um, or increased the, 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 the value apportioned to, um, uh, uh, what's the term that they've used? Um, infectious disease. Um, so here in 2019, before the pandemic, um, uh, arose. It's way down in the list of the most important. Top right is is where your most important issues are on each plot. But then in 2021, you can see it's it's moved slightly. Um, but I'm sure the risk hasn't increased. It's just the understanding of that risk has increased. Um, and that can only be attributed to things like background knowledge of the of the issue that you're talking about. So we're as susceptible to heuristics, and in this case, it might be the availability heuristic, 
Uh, another example of that is where the uh, when the Twin Towers were struck by a terrorist attack, um, people commuting between uh, New York and Washington, um, I think it was New York and Washington, um, feared that they would be um, caught in a similar terrorist attack, so they started driving instead. Um, but the objective risk of driving is much higher than flying, so um, they were affected by the, the availability heuristic there as well. But that was their choice and their decision, given their risk assessment of flying. With specific regard to structural integrity risk, I delved a little bit into what um, what work has been done on um, uh, structural integrity risk measurement specifically, and they're very technical. I won't go into <laughs> the details, but there are lots of different analytical techniques, um, uh, very probabilistic in their form, um, using simulation and, and very dependent on um, uh, properties that, that fly in the face of the operational constraints in which uh, maintenance decision makers are operating as I've described on the right there so there's reliance on expertise to be able to use such analytical techniques or computer simulations and relevant models for the particular fault that you're dealing with um, and that just wasn't helpful for the, the situation I was looking at so I turned to the decision making literature, literature to try and understand from a, a broader perspective and risk analysis forms in is, is kind of a subcomponent of decision making and it would be part of the normative decision analysis literature which is um, types of decision um, tools that that look for optimized solutions and use statistical or probabilistic relationships to try and um, excuse me um, to try and um, uh, give you a, a rational outcome in accordance with the axioms for rational action um, and rules for probability but um, the competing uh, field of descriptive decision analysis, uh, which is largely formed from um, psychology, uh, the field of psychology, has identified that humans aren't rational. And even if presented with a rational looking decision problem, they will act irrationally under some circumstances um, as a consequence of heuristics and biases. So one particular theory which has fallen out from there is the dual process theory, which will become relevant and I'll describe um, in a bit. Uh, and then the last field um, uh, is the prescriptive decision making uh, paradigm, which really attends to um, how to uh, generate a decision aid for people um, in given circumstances. And it attends to uh, the bounded rationality of an individual. So not talking, there's, there's different types of rationality um, in, in accordance with uh, philosophy. Um, and this one in particular is bounded rationality, which talks about the individual um, believing that they're rational as a consequence of the situation they're in and the limitations of their, their uh, cognition. Um, and this really attends to naturalistic decision making, so decision making in natural environments. So I was quite excited to come across this field, um, uh, but there was nothing specifically um, that dealt with aviation decision making or indeed structural integrity. But more generally with the field of, of decision making, um, what I found was uh, there was an assumption that decision making tended, or the type of decision making tool that you would apply, um, tended to be proportional to the, uh, or the, the length of time you applied to a decision was proportional to the amount of time and the importance um, that you should apply to a particular decision. So for example, if you're if you're buying a house, um, for most people that would be a an extremely, um, important decision in their life um, so they will apply a lot of time and thinking and effort to um, uh, coming out with their decision conclusion if it's something more routine or everyday like uh, what flavor packet of crisps do i have for my lunch um, or um, on which foot do i put my shoes then you apply um, much more quick um, and automatic um, in some cases decision um, approaches so you have less time that you need to apply that. But the sort of circumstances I was looking at where you had an extremely important and complex decision about a structural fault, which should, in theory, be given a lot of time and effort to come out with a, a solution, in some cases is not given the time that it needs to, to get a, a normative solution to it. And that's described by this plot here. So the circumstance I was dealing with was point D. Whereas um, I tended to find that points A, B and C was where um, uh, much of the literature tended to sit. <clears throat> the last area of decision making literature was about decision quality, and I won't touch on this too much, although it had relevance to um, my thesis. 
Um, I, I won't talk about it in this presentation, but it's the idea that um, how do you know that you're making a good decision? Um, we tend to be influenced quite heavily by the quality of the outcome, um, but I wanted to know um, how do you know a priori, like before a decision, how do you know that you, you've done everything you can to make a good decision? Uh, and that's what this this area of decision making um, is looking uh, looking at. <clears throat> so the summary of the literature gap was that the, there was essentially nothing um, that I could find um, that specifically attended to um, the situational factors for risk decision making, um, in particular for aviation. Uh, and I also didn't find any secondary data, i.e. information that already existed, which explained how practitioners um, performed um, in, in naturalistic scenarios with risk decision making. The naturalistic field, the, the, the prescriptive paradigm was was uh, quite important to me because it seemed to be attending to the ideas that 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 I was feeling at the core were at the root of what my issue was. Um, and that was that we weren't trying to control all of the variables. We were trying to account for all of the complexity within real world decision making. And the naturalistic field, um, for which I've given some examples on the right there for anyone who's interested, um, but it, it doesn't try and control all the variables like traditional decision making researchers tended to do in, in lab based um, descriptive theories. <clears throat> so that moved me on to uh, trying to understand how real world decision makers acted. And um, uh, I had three case studies uh, which I looked into in, in uh, greater detail. Um, I've talked already about Challenger and um, the Lamington Viaduct and the one on the right um, is a more everyday um, example from uh, military aviation where you've got some tooling damage which um, you might be able to see the slight dents on the, the yellow and the grey bits right in the centre of the picture um, and the decision maker, the maintenance manager opted to um, defer full repair of the uh, the damage because they didn't have the tooling at the location that they were in. They managed a partial repair but they hadn't done it fully in accordance with the um, the repair manual. Um, and that was on his judgment. And it took a month for a reply to get back from from the design organization, which said, yep, that's fine for you to carry on doing that. But for that period, him not being an expert or, or her not being an expert on um, that particular piece of structure and, and the way that it's loaded, um, they were using an unsupported judgment in that fashion. Now, I went out and I collected some survey responses as well uh, from um, engineering practitioners who were self-declared as experienced in these these areas, um, collected quantitative and qualitative data to try and understand um, what what their beliefs and their perceptions about risk were in uh, the real world. And when I combined the answers to the survey with the case studies, there were four themes that fell out. One was that risk concepts were useful to practitioners um, fundamentally. They, they, they were helpful in, um, in guiding how to think about um, these sorts of problems and being able to inform risk decisions. Um, but there were differences in opinion as to how organisations um, were configured to handle structural integrity problems in particular. Um, and uh, for example, they were um, uh, not sure whether you can use a risk matrix to describe um, some individuals were not sure um, whether you could use a risk matrix to, to describe risk or not um, and this this um, particular result um, from the survey showed um, kind of agreed with what I'd experienced actually um, which was that there were differences in opinion as to how you can actually form a risk value for structural integrity problems um, so individuals found that or respondents found that they uh, replied that they they could generate a consequence of occurrence, but it was less easy and there was no consensus essentially on, on how to generate a likelihood of occurrence um, for in-service structural integrity risks. Um, another theme was that there were situational constraints on the way that they formed their decisions, but the key one that I took forward was the fact that there was propensity of the individuals to use judgment. They they relied on their judgment to, to be able to form a risk decision um, uh, basis um, for, for, for supporting their decision making. And this is where I come back to dual process theory. So if we're going to consider how to support decision makers using their judgment, we, we must shape the assessment around that decision maker, which means being cognizant of theories like this. And the dual process theory of cognition describes two cognitive machines that, that frame the human decision making and has bearing on 
uh, the way that a judgment based risk decision making process operates. So type one, and you might have heard this through um, Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, or there's another book um, about, um, I think it's called The Chimp Paradox, but I can't remember the author, I'm afraid. Uh, and they all talk about the same same thing. So it's a very widely held belief about these two systems. Um, Type one decision making, which I've um, described using a man on a bike um, who's pulling out into the road in front of you, really automatic. Um, you don't think about it. It just happens. It's intuitive, um, animalistic and, and some other words there to describe how type one has been de defined previously. Type two, which I've used a chess game, is much more deliberative. Um, so uh, in some, some ways it's analytic um, and uh, cold, rational and objective in the way that it's um, that, that that process operates. And this I felt had bearing on my um, my work. So I tried to frame the decision making situation um, using type one and type two. So on the left of this this temporal um, axis, you can see here um, you've got T0 um, is where you get your, your stimulus. Now your automatic type one decision making will come in at any point between when that stimulus occurs and um, uh, infinitum. Um, it will it will always be influencing your um, your decision making because it's your natural reaction to things. Go a bit further down the time and you might start to undertake some subjective deliberation of the situation. So you'll you'll intrinsically consider um, uh, cues and things that are around you go a bit further and then you might have support coming in from um, analytical sources or from authoritative people who who um, know about the particular circumstances and then you're into a much more supported um, type system and this was um, one of our contributions which was um, that there is actually um, uh, you could separate type two down into this supported and unsupported um, way of thinking about decisions. Now, one way to th to try and get your head into the space that mine was is is to think about how you use your own judgment. Um, now, if I was to ask what the straight line distance was between London and the North Pole, some of you might already have an intuitive answer and pick a number out of thin air. Some of you might be reliant on some techniques if you know absolutely nothing about the geography of the world, um, and you might therefore try and bound your um, your choice by um, using percentiles as, as I've done here. So um, it's not likely to be more than 6,000 miles. It's not likely to be less than 2,000 miles. And somewhere in the middle um, is you know, the most likely, which I think is somewhere around 4,000 miles. Turns out I was extremely far off. Um, oh, this has started not progressing. Are you getting the slides progressing? Got a bit of a pause going on. Oh, there we go. OK, um, turns out I was completely off um, and it's 2,662 miles. Um, but if I asked you those other three follow on questions, um, you might have your own way of building um, a, an answer into that. So, for example, take Swindon to Glasgow driving distance. You might say, well, I recently drove from London to Edinburgh um, and they're roughly on similar signs of lat um, lines of latitude. Um, and the roads are both relatively straight going to them, so I can take a pretty good pot shot at it. And that might be where your judgment comes from. Now, in my view, this is how we, if you're unsupported by anything in an engineering context, you will make a judgment on situations based on experiences and what you've been exposed to previously, um, on information around you. You might be influenced by um, technicians telling you that um, they've seen this before, those kind of things. But we rarely um, externalize that kind of information. So when I came to developing the tool, I wanted to take into account how to capture judgment, but I also needed to be aware of what the survey had said that it wasn't it needed to be not reliant on specialist skills, but it also needed to be usable in operational environments. So coming back to our naturalistic um, influences, what I generated was a um, what's called a fast and frugal tree, which is um, a heuristic device um, that is used for um, or has been researched in naturalistic environments using minimalist cues um, and terminates quickly. It's essentially a flow diagram, but it, it terminates extremely quickly and uses binary decision gates. So there are three gates there. The first one on the left, top left, is um, essentially do you have to make an unsupported judgment in this circumstance that you're in? Um, 
If no, then follow those um, supporting instructions that you've got because you don't have to use an unsupported judgment. Um, and that's obviously going to be a much more preferred um, way of moving than, than essentially using your, your judgment and your experiences, which are, um, as I referred to earlier, known to be biased. If it's um, yes, you do have to use your judgment unsupported, then move to gate two, which asks the um, decision maker to form a sound judgment. And the sound judgment here is on the basis of informal logic um, and asks the individual to try and arrange information about um, the, the decision making circumstance, the information that they're using um, in order to, to create a sound argument. And they're, they're, um, when I went through the training with the individuals who, who tested this, um, they were given a, um, a description of what they're looking for for a sound argument. Then if you can form a sound argument, then you move on to gate three, which is um, where you try and debias your answers as far as possible. Now, all of the, and I'll come back to that in a second, all of the um, terminations then lead down to this, this uh, bottom block saying record the argument. Now, the benefit of recording the argument, I've used something called the Toolman scheme in here, which has been used previously by um, some Airbus employees to um, structure goal structuring notation um, type arguments about design choices for aircraft. Uh, and they were based in Bristol, I believe. Um, but what this allows you to do is to describe and, and um, verbalize your judgment and the information that you're using in your judgment um, into a, a network of, um, uh, of information or a presentation of information. When you come to gate three, you then have a set of information and a construction that allows um, somebody who's supporting you and debiasing you, a peer or um, an advisor or somebody that you trust um, to look at the information you've got and they can then challenge aspects of it and contribute it. And this is, um, really bringing in um, the values of metacognition, um, which is essentially thinking about thinking. So you're thinking about your own thinking and trying to operationalize metacognition in circumstances where judgment is used routinely um, in aircraft maintenance. So the whole idea of the Toolman structure to very briefly is that you try and get from your grounds to your claim. And your claim in this case would be whether the aircraft is safe to fly or or not and your grounds would be your starting point so it might be the damage that you've got or some knowledge about the damage um, that you have and you do that br you bridge between the two by using something called an inference license which is essentially the information contained within um, as you can see there the bridge and the support and then they're challenged by the voiding conditions now the bridge and the support are essentially your the information that you're using to allow you to get from damage to aircraft safe to fly so it might be something like i know that that um, structure is tertiary structure so it's not that important in terms of um, load bearing it might be superficial or something like that um, and your support to that would be your knowledge about why tertiary instru tertiary structure is um, is not load bearing for example or the authoritative document which tells you that um, the voiding conditions would be your assumptions um, about that particular um, uh, argument and the information that you're using. So by writing that type of information down and getting it um, out in the open, it then allows the debiaser at gate three to go, well, hang on a minute, what about this? Uh, and they might be able to then contribute or challenge what you've put down because they, they, they see um, holes in the argument. And an example of this is uh, what I've got here, um, which is... Uh, it was post hoc, so it's not quite realistic, but it's what the type of consideration that I thought about for the um, the plate removal on the tornado. So the grounds were that um, corrosion was commonly identified on the wing skins during plate removal. So that was an experiential piece of information. We know that they found corrosion uh, during previous plate removal. That made me feel uncertain. So my initial judgment was that the aircraft is not safe to fly. So how did I bridge those two together? Well, I know that aircraft usage is analogous. Um, therefore, the, if they're analogous, then um, and the usage is analogous and they've been exposed to similar environments, then it's likely that the corrosion exists across multiple aircraft. Um, so you can see there's a kind of deconstruction of what would be um, a really obvious and naturally inferred um, uh, argument anyway but by writing it down you allow challenge to um, presumptions um, in in arguments so to test this um, i built um, six scenarios um, test cases 
um, with a fictitious aircraft that looks remarkably like an F-15, but you'll note uh, for the spotters out there that it only has one tailplane, um, thanks to the mastery of Microsoft Paint, um, and it also only has one seat, um, whereas the F-15 clearly has two. Um, so, uh, and the reason for that was to try and um, decouple anyone who had experiences of working on F-15 who were part of the, the test cohort um, from influencing the way that they judged this. And it, it, the intention was, um, it's a relatively new aircraft. I gave them some context of it um, and had them understand what the, the aircraft had been doing and what type of fleet it was and what type of flying it was. Um, and then I built these textual scenarios based on, um, uh, they were pseudo real, so they were, partly my experiences, but also some experiences that I'd collected during identification of potential case studies during the um, during the uh, initial data collection. And then I plotted some images as well for them to try and understand uh, visually what um, the scenario was. And I, there were six of these. Um, and, and then I compared uh, a cohort who'd been trained in my novel framework um, against a control cohort who had no training were essentially given a blank text box and told use the method that you typically follow and this, this wasn't um, uh, you know reckless in the way that I'd done this because um, actually the way that aircraft maintenance documentation is at the minute you're just given a blank box anyway to provide you justification as to what your maintenance decisions are and what you've done um, so that wasn't um, uh, you know too too silly in the way that I'd done that <clears throat> So I used non-naive participants so that they could understand the test cases. Um, six test cases, as I said, and there were five um, people in each of the cohorts of the intervention and control. Um, and I paired those up um, by experience level. So if somebody said they had five years experience of structure integrity risk decision making, I'd pair them up. Uh, but that was in the intervention. I'd pair them up with somebody who was round about five years um, in the control so that when the two answers were then compared. Um, they were then not um, too dissimilar in in the type of it, of response you'd expect for someone of that level of experience. And I saw two types of of result. Uh, one was the user experience. So how did the people who used the intervention find it? And they agreed generally that the um, intervention would be usable in the operational situations, which was um, great. Um, and they were also very confident in the decisions that they documented. What I then did, the second result I was looking for, was to understand um, whether the control or the intervention provided um, better transparency, better justification, or um, uh, which one was easier to understand. And I used 11 uh, raters who compared um, uh, six um, test cases each. And um, the results for this, and I've thrown up the full chart just in case anybody is a statistician and wants to pick holes in my uh, my analysis, but um, uh, essentially I used a, an ANOVA test to um, compare the Leica scales that the, the raters scored, so uh, which one is better and by how much um, was essentially what we asked. Uh, and the results showed that there was a statistical difference for justification and transparency in favour of the um, novel decision method, um, but there was no difference for ease of understanding, which is we kind of expected because um, the way that the information was presented would have been new to the raters as well. So I'm not surprised by that result, but it was great to see that um, from um, recording um, and audit trail perspectives that the novel method um, provided better justification and transparency um, about the judgment that was made. So in conclusion, um, I, my research project um, identified that practitioners um, in ma aviation maintenance circumstances um, are compelled to make unsupported judgment based decisions um, when they're constrained by their circumstances. My method found that there was um, some value um, in using a heuristic uh, based method and documenting their arguments um, uh, for supporting their judgment in operational situations. Um, and I also found that, that that novel method provided a better audit trail over an unstructured um, decision method, uh, which I was pretty happy about because that was what I'd set out to achieve um, three years uh, prior to that. Uh, well, in fact, before that, um, back in 2016 when I was at Tornado, so I was um, extremely chuffed that I'd managed to, to find a solution for that. 
Um, there's a quick rundown of the contributions to knowledge there, but um, one thing to note, or a couple of things to note, is that as a consequence of COVID, um, there were some limitations on the way that I could test the framework, um, largely in the way that the sort of naturalistic circumstances that, that I could test it. So gate three couldn't be tested because it was remote uh, and virtual using an online survey platform. Um, and um, I couldn't test it in in naturalistic environments and under differing safety climates for the for the same reasons. So there is some work um, still to do in um, in testing this method, um, but I'm pretty encouraged by it. And I do have some opportunities now back in the Air Force to try and um, pursue, um, although they're not quite as widespread as I'd, I'd thought. But um, um, so, uh, yeah, that was a summary of the contribution to knowledge. And then there's a, a big list of the references if anybody noted any of them throughout and wanted to um, dig those out later. Um, but that concludes my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions uh, and no hard questions from Laura because I've seen her in the audience. <laughs> um, but uh, thanks for your time. So thank you very much, uh, Richard. It was uh an excellent presentation on a very uh, contemporary it's going it's going to be always a contemporary issue for uh, military aviation structural integrity especially with older aircraft but also with newer aircraft as well because new aircraft uh, you know has uh, have their own you know array of problems in that regards in terms of you know resolving structural integrity issues so uh, thank you again yeah.